Thank you very much. And um, some of the things which I would have loved to to talk about with so much interest and so much vigor, I've been dealt with the past two speakers. And one of the past speakers, my former tutor, uh -huh. I can't say things against him. <laughs> You can, you can. Yes, I can. <laughs> but he knows where to catch me later. <laughs> but I also know where to catch him because I will just write to some people in Indonesia and in Georgia and say, hey, see what Howard did to me. <laughs> so I will try to skip some of the things, wonderful examples which he had raised. And in fact, I, not because I don't want to oppose him, but because the things he has raised are true. The things he has raised are easy to follow. I will only try to buttress some items here. Because some of the presentations come from the external perspective. They would like to see what happens from the internal side. So I start with this guy, Walter Rodney, which I think my man mentioned earlier. Some of the things Rodney said in 1973, through one of the activists which we all celebrate, still resonate till today. So my question is, since 73, what has changed? It's very simple. 73, the unquestionable fact that underdeveloped countries are in total stagnation and the rate of economic growth is lower than that of population increase. These characteristics, they do, they do not come by accident. It is a fault of the capitalist system, transfers to the dependent countries the most abusive and barefaced forms of exploitation of man by man. The only way to solve it is to eliminate that exploitation mm -hmm with all the consequences that it implies. And he tried in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, that was 1973, to provide, okay, what is the definition of development? And then um, what is the definition of underdevelopment? And he tried to tell us that, look, underdevelopment is, does not mean the absence of development. Just that in some instances, we can look at development from two per under development from two perspectives. And one of the perspectives is to try to see whether it's on comparison, on comparative issues, comparative in the sense that yes, you can say, okay, this country has a better human development index than the other. Or to look at it from the exploitative perspective, exploitation of man by man. And it is on that aspect. I want us to go back, to step back a bit from the exploitation and see, okay, from the comparison, what can we tease out? And there are two levels of comparison. First, the internal comparison within countries, and secondly, the inter-country comparisons. And then we see what countries have done internally to get out of this system, and whether the system is cyclical, like he tried to show in his graph. And in fact, one funny thing about the graph is this. The growth we are celebrating is actually the growth, the level we reached in the 1960s. So yes, we are all proud of it, it's going up, but it's because we are going back to 1960, 50 years back, or 60 in certain cases. And again, as you pointed out, yeah, many things date back to the colonial era. Many things date back to the 1980s, especially when Two unfortunate one unfortunate circumstance happened. That was the issue of geography. Rains refused to fall. Famine started in many countries in the early 80s in Africa. Well, people need food, as simple as that. And the best way to address this balance of payment issues is come for our loans. That was IMF and World Bank. And these loans came with conditionalities. You must reduce in practical terms, the staff that the government pays money for salaries, which automatically means when you reduce it, you retrench, you lay off staff, and automatically, of course, 
there's no income, automatically poverty level increases. The second thing is remove subsidies, which I think has been um, wrongly dealt with. Remove subsidies. Don't give subsidy to education. Don't give it to agriculture. Don't give it to manufacturing sector. Depend on us, and of course, which automatically means depend on imports. And the more you import, the more you spend the scarce foreign reserves that you have. And the cycle continues, continued dependency. Again, we talk of um, this issue of the wars, the imperialist wars. I call them the proxy wars. The proxy wars in the DRC, like uh, our previous speaker I just mentioned. DRC, largest country, very large, bigger than a sizable proportion of um, Europe. But rich in resources in what we all use almost every five minutes. And some companies need those resources to make sure that this continues to function. And we all use it anyway. We are, we are consumers. And that's the problem again with Africa. Consuming continent instead of production. Now the issue is that if we continue to consume and we know that the answer is in production, like I said, manufacturing, then how do we arrive at that level of manufacturing? The problem seen in, the 19, in 1973 by Rodney, how come we have not gotten out of it? How come we are talking about it again today, 43 years or 42 years after? Something that has been contextualized. Now I go back to 1950s in Nigeria, which I, I will basically, I will base most of my examples on. And Nigeria got independent in 1960 from British colonial rule, the imperialists. But 10 years before that, Nigeria was divided into three regions. The Southwest region taught it wise. Again, going back to the recommendation of the previous speaker, education. Education is the answer. We need to read ourselves of a curriculum that only reproduces staff for the colonial establishment. The original government of the Southwest decided to embark on universal primary education, made it free, made it compulsory, funded it, even despite on that colonial system, funded it with its own money and communal contributions. So that was the first step to get out of that dependency. 1955. 1957, the Southeastern government in Nigeria, still under colonialism, again said, no, we need to get out of this. Also copied the Southwest. The unfortunate part was that as the South, combining the Southeast and the Southwest, understood that we can get out of this dependency, Again, of course, the imperialists who are working down. No, you guys in the north, you don't need education. Part of it is because, yes, you are Muslims. It is Christian curriculum that you are, they're going to use. So why do you want to? And stupidly, excuse me for using that word, the not complied. But for the next 30 years, there was a differential in educational attainment, in skill building in Nigeria, such that the South was more developed, became more developed than the North. In fact, if you still go to Nigeria today, the industries that you find, you find them much more in the South. In fact, the enthusiasm for you, if, even if you are a foreign investor, the only place you really you can quickly find <coughs> staff will be in the south. So you just locate them. The south, the north has remained underdeveloped. That's the place we also have the Boko Haram issue. We also know the history of the Boko Haram, where for a very long time the United States, Israel, and a few other countries that we think should support the destruction of this destructive force actually said, no, we're not going to support. I mean, despite the noise we're making the media. 
So that's one thing. The second thing also is this issue of democracy. <coughs> and man, I want to talk about it earlier. Again, now the new wave, African countries must get developed and must, must move from military rule to democratic rule. But you don't have funds. We need to fund you. But I'm going to say something controversial here, which I would like you not to take controversially. <laughs> And the thing is this, we will give you money, but we want you, well, some of the previous governments have been corrupt, but we want that in the parliament, in many African countries, we want that the parliament must have at least 30% women. I don't oppose women being in parliament, I don't oppose women being in, in, in leadership. In fact, I have sisters, younger and older, who work, I mean, they, 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 where they work today, they are one of the best in their, in, in their professions. So, <coughs> what I just provided there, unfortunately, that was what, I don't know, maybe it's also a, an imperial problem, because there was a graph I wanted to show, which I have shown you, that really, there's a big problem, not with women education, but with women in parliament. Human Development Index, if you look at the 2014 data, what it shows us is this, the more you are developed, the less the number of women you have in parliament. <laughs> the second thing is this. However, the more you are developed, the more you have women in technical sectors of the economy. So many African countries took, because they needed the funds. Anyway, so they decided to, okay, let's have women in parliament, but nominated, not elected. And whoever you nominate to a position actually answers to whoever nominated you to that position. You don't have that independence in decision making. You don't have that independence in policy making. So again, it dovetails into what we call the problems of governance. This is where the map was supposed to be that gave us problem. You will have actually been impressed with it. But however, let's move forward finally to population issues. Because that is another problem which we need to internally deal with. In Africa, growing populations and the need, whether there is a specific need to embark on population policies, what type of policies do we need to embark on in underpopulation <coughs> programs, and does it affect human rights? Does it impinge on the use of contraception, for instance? By 2050, Africa's population will have gone far ahead to the, all the other world's regions. And that's, it has implications for food production, it has implications for town planning, it has impl implications for governance, it has implications for weighthood. Weighthood is what Professor Alcinda Owana talked about when she was here as a Prince Klaus chair a few years back. And weighthood is the fact that we have a mass, a big amount of African students or the educational sector that continues to reproduce, again, sorry for the word, graduates that really acquire education that does not have any relationship to economic growth. A comparative example I will use is Indonesia. Indonesia started its own universal primary education under Suatu uh, a few years back but geared towards manufacturing, so that within 20 years, those that graduated had to enter the middle level, um, not, not the heavy industries, but the middle industries, and then uh, it propelled Indonesia to part of the level which we have uh, today. So one of the things which I would like us to consider is the fact that in looking at the answers, we have to look at what can be done in the short term, medium term, and long term? Education, we say, what do we need to achieve with education? I have examples of what the Southwest Nigeria and Southeast Nigeria did that could be repeated. Education was also one of the examples given earlier. Also, this issue of the internal versus external. Yes, there are problems with WTO, there are problems with GATT. However, we need first 
to solve internal food self-sufficiency. The internal food self-sufficiency was what propelled into Indonesia to the level it became today. And the problem with it again is that bird flu, I will close here. Bird, bird flu, we all heard of it. Yes, it's troublesome. Now the birds are dying. The human strain, then it gets worse to scare all of us. The human strain of the bird flu kills faster than whatever. So therefore, all chicken producing countries must cull their birds. Kill your poultry off. All of a sudden, Nigeria realized that if we kill our poultry, we will start importing frozen chicken. So Nigeria refused. But all the countries around Nigeria, of course, scared of bird flu, killed all their chicken. They are chicken importers, poultry importers today. Nigeria is not. Thank you. Thank you.